sure that way. Alan, I uh, probably will also be talking to you about all of this when I get done. Mm -hmm. I'm still working on it. Yeah. Okay. Well, it is officially four o'clock. Here we go. I would like to thank you all today for um, coming together with me as part of this panel. We're going to be discussing professionals and discrimination. What happens when we do the work and we are the victims of discrimination? How does that affect our brand? How does that affect the brand we work with? How do we move forward? With that being said, my name is Terri Ann Nash and I'm the CEO of Nash Inspired. Today to facilitate this wonderful conversation, I have Mr. Greg Fontas. Greg is currently a DEI consultant. He's a trainer, strategist, and motivator who seeks to empower people and teams to be exclusively excellent in multiple spaces. He works every day with a hope to elevate others and understanding the importance of celebrating and honoring all groups of people, in particular those who have been historically mar marginalized and oppressed. His personal call to action comes from Reverend James Lawson, who stated that we are citizens of a country that does not yet exist. It is our duty to usher that country into existence. And so Greg, I would like to thank you for coming and being a part of the panel today and actually um, facilitating this um, conversation and moving us into another space. Thank you, Terry Ann, for having me. I'm so excited to be a part of this, uh, being a part of this uh, program, to be a uh, part of your story, right, which this has stemmed out of. And so just grateful to be here on today. Thank you. And so I also would like to go ahead at this time and do the introductions, and then I'll briefly introduce, introduce myself, and then I'm going to hand the um, floor back over to you, Greg. Okay. So at this time... I would like to introduce our interpreter, um, Lashiria Murphy. Lashiria basically, not basically, she's an entrepreneur of her own company, Hands Up Interpreting. She's an experienced interpreter working in the music industry, virtual interpreting as well as, well as medical and nonprofit organizations. Lashiria's business is a national business. She's currently working on her international brand and she hails out of the Chicago area. I also have Mr. Alan Hill, a retired Air Force vet after 21 years. He spent 12 years in the role of a technology educational specialist where he instructed the faculty, and technology tool, faculty on technology tools that developed their curriculums. As a licensed low voltage electrical contractor in Georgia, he is the owner of Magnum Opus Sound and Lighting, providing event productions and high-end AV integration work in the Atlanta, Georgia area. We have uh, Kay. Kay, can you help me out with your last name? Because I want to make sure I get it right. It's got a French twang to it. It's pronounced Como. Thank you, Como. Ms. Kay also goes by the artist's name of Art Joy. Ms. Casey Gray education, family advocate with Minneapolis Parent Union, educator, lecturer, voiceover artist in pursuit of her educational specialist degree on the path with an education PhD. She's an activist with Justice Page Amendment supporter and a chef with a passion for her people. Miss Kay hails out of the Chicago Midwest area and is residing in the Twin Cities at this time. We also have on the panel I'll switch mediums here, sorry. To Mr. Jawan Jackson. Jawan Jackson is out of the California area. I'm just gonna go a little bit on uh, him and I'm gonna let him actually finish this up. He was born and raised hard of hearing and merged into, merges in and out of the deaf community, mainstream, as well as attending the Gallia Deaf. He classifies himself as a deaf advocate and has worked professionally in that area, traveling back and forth through the Twin Cities, working on various projects such as conferences, 
eliminating barriers in the deaf community, as well as working with the uh, National Recording Artists, The Sound of Blackness, and Sweet Honey and the Rock under Natch Inspired. Juwan, would you like to uh, add anything to that? I want to um, I want to add that uh, that uh, I want to being involved in the deaf community has its barriers, and um, my by meaning it barriers uh, through communication access and often have a miscommunication uh, accessibility through work environment and also in school environment to uh, how people uh, missing. Uh, So you want a voice for him, Lashiria? Yeah. Being in the deaf community, there it has its barriers. And sometimes you feel you know, you know, not satisfied with what you receive. Like part of those barriers that I've experienced. Like you feel like you get pushed out often. You know, like with hearing, you know, sometimes there is no clarification. And most of the time, like hearing people tend to see me, see my eyes, and I can't, you know, use my ears. Often the communication gets kind of messed up. So that causes a problem sometimes in different situations. You know, as in the deaf community, it tries to be more of a collaboration. Right. And that's kind of why we're here today, because we're going to be talking about how we're going to collaborate or collaborate or work together. Okay. So now let's do that. Um, Juwan, thank you for um, giving us that information. But let's take it now another level for you. Okay. So with that being said, um, I'm going to basically let you know, I'm Terri Ann Nash, and I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Nash Inspired. Nash Inspired is a company that works to inspire the greatness in others. We work on your brand. We work with you on who you are and what you can impact the world with. It is my goal and my aspiration to utilize my perspective, my philosophy, and my joy of life to impact and hopefully influence and change the world. Follow me, let's do it together. Let's celebrate life. But today we're here to talk about something else. So Greg, I'm gonna turn this back over to you and let you be the facilitator. Sure, thank you, Terry Ann. So um, this program, our, our discussion tonight actually stems from a personal account from Miss Terry Ann. Um, and I'm gonna allow her to share her story in just a little bit. Um, but as she and I were talking and discussing, you know, not too long ago, um, you know, she had this burden to share this story. And I believe that one of the ways that change can happen in our communities, in our organizations, is from being able to share what we've experienced and learn from that. And so I'm actually going to turn it right back over um, to Terri Ann for her to share a personal account of something that happened to her 
some of you may actually resonate with this. Some of you may um, have had personal accounts that are very similar to this, right? Um, as in particular to those who are of black and brown bodies, right? Uh, many of us may have been victimized at some point in our experience, whether it's in the professional space, uh, whether it's in a relational space, whether it's in the congregational space, uh, regardless of where it may be. This is something that um, I believe that many of us may resonate with it. So Terry Ann, Ms. Terry Ann, if you're ready to share your, your personal account of what happened to you, uh, I just want to turn the floor over to you for you to give that time um, for, for you to have the space to, to share your story and for us to just honor first your experience and honor you as you, as you navigate through this. Wonderful. Thank you. So first of all, my disclaimer is our discussion today is not about bashing any one particular company or we're not here to trash um, anyone in a negative way. We're here basically to seek understanding, healing, and hope that we can offer some help to other people. So with that being said, one of the things that um, I sought out to do in the um, COVID time was look at how I could build my brand and look at what I could do to further my professional career, basically working on my BDA. So I went and decided to check into the Hilton Two as an extended stay. And I was my uh, plan was to stay a month. Well, after about eight days of being there, I um, went down to renew my membership. I mean, my uh, re uh, reservation. One moment, I'm going to pull this up so I can exactly, so I can read to you exactly what I wrote. So I went to uh, renew my reservation. And in the doing that, everything went smooth. I had already been there about eight days. So for me, it was nothing more than just to um, go down, renew the reservation and keep it moving. Well, I was there for three reasons. I had a, um, I had a book signing. I had recently been involved in a book. I also was working with a national conference on undoing racism with Eddie Gloud um, called Undoing Racism. And then I was getting ready for my BDA, which that I wanted to work with the Sheraton in branding the Sheraton and doing a branding exercise. So once I was there, I sent the letter to the manager. And upon sending the letter, um, I got... A, a nice letter back from her say, stating that she would love to meet with me. Um, upon getting that back, I thought we would meet. And so that Friday, I went down and I paid the money for the next week. And I was instructed to get a car, a, a new key the next morning. So when the next morning came, I went down and I got the key. I left to go to the radio station and deliver my books, deliver my books to my mom. And part of the book signing uh, deal was that we were supposed to go online and do a virtual opening up in a grand deal. So I had that planned. I had the um, training planned for the conference. So I was supposed to learn how to flip my switches with the Zoom. And then um, from there, continuing on. Well, when I got back to the hotel, the staff woman saw me and she hits the stairs. I walk down the hallway, she follows me down the hall. I wasn't sure why she was following. I didn't even know she was following me actually. So I turned around and courteously said, excuse me, am I in your way? She says, oh no. So when I get to my door, she stops at my door with me and says, does your key work? And I said, well, it should work. You just gave it to me earlier this morning. Well, lo and behold, it didn't work. So she turns around and she takes off back downstairs. She doesn't say a word to me. So I follow her back downstairs because there's nothing else I can do. By this time, I have a big luggage rack. I'm pushing with all my books and all my stuff, my promo stuff. I'm on my suit on, my hair's all done, my makeup's on. I get down there and she says, you don't have a reservation. I said, well, yeah, I do. So I show her my phone where I paid for the money. She didn't even want to look at that. So I tell her the name of the staff people who helped me she didn't even want to really hear that. She's actually just ignoring me, totally ignoring me. So I thought, okay, maybe it's my imagination. So I said, well, you know, while you're handling this, if you could just give me a key to the room so I can go take care of my stuff. She ignored me. After about three more minutes, I said it again, she ignored me. 
Now, after five minutes, I decided to step away from the counter completely because my EI was kicking in and I wanted to make sure that when my EI kicked in, I was following everything because I saw this clearly what was going on. So I sat down and I spoke very loudly and very clearly across the room. I said, I just wanna make sure that I understand that you are keeping me from my personal effects and that you are not allowing me in the room until you figure out your computer glitch. And she, I said, so that means I can't even get my purse. She says, well, I'll take you to the room to get your purse. And then I said, no, you're not gonna take me to get anything. You're gonna finish this and you're gonna take care of it. And while you're taking care of it, I'm going to also help you. And I called corporate. So long and the short of it, corporate got involved. She escorted me to my room, did not give me a key and left me sitting in the room. But corporate's still on the phone. Corporate calls downstairs, makes this young lady come upstairs. The new changing staff brings me a key. The shift change brings me a key. And then um, corporate writes me and tells me to go see the management and they'll help me. So I go see the management um, that Monday and they're pro she apologized to me and promised me eight comp days. Well, there were some other things that I started to notice about that particular establishment, like the fact that there was one woman of color that worked there. She was the go-to person for everybody there. And she had been working there for two years. Her management staff that was over her had less than a year between the two of them, one six months and one six weeks. Yet this young lady was bilingual. So she was handling all of the housekeeping. She was also handling all of the training of the new staff. She was also coming in early doing the data put entry. And she was also covering for staff who couldn't make it or needed to go home early. So I observed all of this in the 16 days that I was there. And by the end of it, I couldn't take it anymore. And I said, I am not staying here to keep this going. I cannot support this type of business. So I went to staff. I told them I would be leaving. And lo and behold, once I left, my credit card was ran for $444.41 for the days that I planned on not staying. I was then told that I would get my money back and reconcile it with my bank. I'm like, well, my bank didn't even know I was staying here. Why did you run my credit card? Um, the bank, end result, the bank ended up feeling that I had also been damaged by this particular hotel. And they wrote a letter to Visa, gave me my money back. I had a friend pick me up with all of my things and I departed the, you know, the Hilton upon that morning that's when they charged me that when I left. And um, it took me five days for my bank to reconcile it and give me my money back. And unfortunately, I did not hear back from that particular corporate branch that said they would be checking into it, nor did I ever hear back from that particular location and the management and the hotel that harmed me. So my thing is in the pursuit of happiness, as I look at Will Smith and I look at us as black professionals, I went there with an intention in mind. My brand got harmed by someone who worked there who was nasty and discriminatory. And I had to leave there, but I'm not even whole. I didn't get the opportunity I set out to get. Um, I was treated badly. <laughs> to do this work. So, um, Greg, that's basically what happened. Oh, thank you so much for sharing that, um, that story, that personal account of what your experience was um, while at the Hilton. And um, I think the first question for our discussion that I just wanted to lay out there is, you know, how does this make you feel to, to all of our panelists, participants? How does this make you feel? Like, do you have any personal resonances to this story? Uh, what are your initial thoughts and reactions as you hear this personal account? So uh, I wanna just invite anyone to kind of just jump in and share um, as you see fit. Um, and we'll just start there and organically navigate the conversation. But how does this make you feel? Thoughts, resonances? I'll go first. Or do you have an order? 
There's no order. You can you can jump right in. Go ahead. I felt I felt um, compassion for Ter uh, Terry Ann, but I felt violated as a as a professional black uh, woman in a corporate uh, in, in a establishment where she paid her money and she was treated in such a way. Just to read that, uh, I'm in those situations many times myself, and I just I felt violated, and so um, that is why I'm I'm agreed to come on this up. Uh, panel. Uh, injustice to Terry Ann is an injustice to any uh, African American or person of color in a corporate environment that's treated in a subpar manner. Our money is green. We spend the money just like the Europeans and everybody else. We deserve the same dignity and respect that they get. And when we don't get it, um, there should be a platform for us to air out any corporation or store or establishment that, um, that inflict injustice or racism upon us. So that that's how I felt. I felt violated because um it could happen to me. It probably has, you know, happened as far as people following me around or mishandling me or mischarging my credit card intentionally. And um it, it, it's wrong, it's been happening, but we need a forum or a platform to air out these incidents. And so this is the first partaking that I uh, am engaging in to be able to elaborate on it. So there you have it. I felt violated for her and I put myself in her shoes. Yeah. So as a leader, we must demand equity in treatment, equity in services on every encounter on every accord. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would, I would agree. I think it's important um, as um, people of color that we stand our ground against discrimination and mistreatment. And, uh, you know, we are way past the point of giving white folks a pass for how they come at us. And I think it's a uh, it's unfortunate that, you know, our sister Terry Ann had to go through something like this. I think it's important that we use um, her experiences along with our own experiences to really um, find a vehicle or means to really hold these corporations accountable, right? And I just don't think we should be letting people off the hook for how they come at us funky. I just think it is, it's disrespectful. And um, the, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't know. No, we're not, <laughs> we're, we're just not taking that as an excuse anymore. I think it, as people of color, we oftentimes have, um, we have to operate in a space where we can't make the mistakes. Like, oh, I didn't know. I'm sorry. I'll do better next time. And that seems to be the go-to um, when people get called out on their on their racism or their discrimination. I just think we should hold hold them account for that. And I just want to jump in here to add with that, Alan. Part of the work that I do also, which really concerns me, is when as a professional and we go out. I kept thinking. What if I didn't have the training, the EI, the emotional intelligence training? What if I wasn't equipped to deal with that kind of situation that particular day? Um, what happened to me was that was the last activity of the day because I did cry my makeup out. I'm not going to lie. I was so frustrated and I was so outdone that by the time I got done with corporate on the phone, I literally was in tears. My hands were shaking. And so I have to think about even people who may not be able to articulate for themselves or may not have had the um, resources to communicate clearly. And that's kind of what brings me to making sure that I keep the intersectionalities going. Like with Juwan, how did it make you feel, Juwan?
you voicing that, Lashiria? I can't hear anything, and I don't see his video. Okay. You can't see Juwan's video? No, I can't. I only see yours. Oh. Hold on. Is that better? Hold on. I might have to squat. Okay. There you go. I had to switch. Okay. My camera view. Okay. Um, I felt very, very sad um, when I went through that. And, you know, I really didn't need to go through that, you know. And I had some ideas. Like, um, I had some ideas on what to do. Like, if, if a deaf person... Hold on one minute because I'm really struggling to see his video because it's small and I don't know how to make it big. Hold on. Let me see. Pin his video. You can pin his video. Pin his video. Yeah. Okay. I got it. I'm an old lady. <laughs> okay. Okay. It's better now. I felt very, very saddened by this. Um, like, my dream is that I didn't want to have to go through that, you know, and I had envisioned that what if, you know, a deaf person had went through the same situation. And, you know, and then you have to increase You know, you had increased anxiety and then miscommunication with the deaf person. And, and it becomes over frustrating. You become so over frustrated. Like in different kind of scenarios. With that, with that situation. So um, I felt, I felt that it was really unfair. Yeah, yeah, well, thank you for for all of you for just sharing your thoughts on that. And for me, I think there's so many complexities in your story, Terry Ann, from your own feeling um, invisible, right, and ignored, right? And then, um, you know, the lack of having a voice, right, as you were kind of trying to share and articulate, hey, this is what my experience is like, but, you know, they kept disregarding that. Um, complexities for the other worker that was there, right? And I can just imagine, you know, how often she is experiencing that because, you know, you were there just for a moment, right? You, you know, you spent some time there, um, but that's not your day-to-day -day profession, right? You don't live there, right? And, but there was, you mentioned there was someone else who was running and doing all of the stuff who had been there for who knows how long they've been there and they seem to have been looked over. They did not seem to be up for promotion or in that role of that leadership, if you will. And in my mind, what, what comes to mind is that there's, it feels as though there's like this perpetual state um, that this other person was in, this perpetual state of always feeling ignored and undervalued and, and unappreciated. Right. And as many of us have stated, you know, we felt angered or we felt sad or, you know, just, you know, this was just daunting on us. I can only imagine just what that other individual must feel daily, right? Being a person of color and coming into a particular space and always feeling like, well, will I ever get that opportunity to be in that leadership position or oversee individuals um, because I've been here for a while, I understand the systems. And for me, what comes to mind is that there feels like there's this perpetual state 
of discrimination and oppression or racism that people of color face, right? And so whoever wants to jump in and kind of, you know, address that, you know, I want us to talk a little bit about, you know, that perpetual state of oppression that we can feel like we're in as people of color, right? For some of us, we may have worked at a company for X amount of years, but never, but have always been passed over for promotion. For some of us, we have been fighting this good fight forever, right? And and still feeling not as though we're not heard. So, um, or feeling as though we're just angry, like angry black woman or something like that, right? Where we give those, given those stereotypes and those monikers, if you will. So I, I want us to touch base a little bit on you know, what does it mean or, or what are some of those realities of always feeling as though we're in that perpetual state of oppression, that oppression, perpetual state of discrimination and racism um, in our context. So Greg, I wanna jump in with that and then I'm gonna open it up to Alan and, and Kay. And the reason I'm jumping in is because we are the perpetual result of that. Alan left Minnesota, the epicenter. Kay has come here, the epicenter. There's a reason that George Floyd happened here. There's a reason that we are talking about this now and this is going throughout the nation. We need to know that it's not a just about being beat up by the police to have our careers ruined, but that we can walk into a store any given time, any type of business, that we can go to college for years to work on a career and then go to a job and be harassed. We're not talking necessarily about a company or an organization, but we're talking about the systemic discrimination that makes them think that they can go to their place of business and be authorized to act independently and be awful to people and ruin people's days, lives, and careers. So in my point, the reason I went all the way to Egan, which is a suburb of Minneapolis or in the Minnesota Twin Cities area was because of the epicenter. We don't have anything in our Twin Cities area right now. It's been torn down. So now we're forced to go out into the outskirts areas to deal with people who may not have dealt with us every day because we don't have anything left. And so again, this is all part of a perpetual system and I, so um, I just want to throw that out there, Kay, Alan. Okay, so so basically, discrimination, race, hate, all that you know, in America, it's it's an atmosphere, and unfortunately, with forty six minus one in office, we're back of in the climate of what I grew up in. Okay. Um, during the civil rights movement. And so it's sickening actually, but um, basically I still feel compelled to speak out. You reached out, you told us about what happened at the Hilton. And so I agreed to voice my, my leadership opinion against it because disc discrimination is an attack against humanity. You know, so we must, we must use our voice Anytime a sister or brother come to us with a situation, we must use our voice to unify and speak out against race hate and the injustice that comes about when we are um, inflicted uh, with, with, with treatment that we know is, is, is subpar. So basically racism has reared its ugly head all across America. So we, we must con collectively continue and push in with iron spines to be change agents or agents for change when it happens. And when we can when we can put our finger on it and we can document it and we can put a, a, a date, a name and a place and a person to it, we need to hold that company and that employee accountable. So what I would ask is if there's a way that you can drop in the chat the corporate email that you've contacted and the phone number so that not only this panel, but the viewers, you said that you were going to expose this on LinkedIn to the um, algorithm so that it can loop. Yep. People need to be able to have access if they want to take this experience that you had a step for further and email and call corporate just so that you don't endure this alone. Um, reading your email personally, 
I, I put myself in that atmosphere because that has happened. I I love going to the Hilton is in Doubletree. They own by the same chain. Uh, it's my chain of choice. I go to Marriott and a lot of other ones, uh, Radisson, but Hilton, I like, uh, I like, I, I used to work for the Hilton when I was in high school in Chicago, 720 South Michigan. So uh, I get the rewards and all that. And even as a rewards member and having a corporate car, I still have been discriminated. I've, I've gone to a room and didn't, um, it couldn't get in and had to go more than one time. So it might be a culture. Uh, it might be embedded in their culture, but we won't know unless we talk to each other or we air it. And then others may have similar uh, encounters and we, we need to speak out against Hilton and any other corporation that um, continue to inflict racial discrimination and racial, racial hatred upon people of color. So it's an it's a, a way too common uh, uh, connection that many professionals can relate to being treated in an unjust manner or being billed an uh, inaccurate amount. Like you thinking it's isolated, but it's not. It's it's a, it's a culture that we're living in, and it's bitter. It's nasty, and I'm I'm again I'm sorry. I'm I'm disgusted that here we are in the end of 2020. But this is this is our reality, and the, we've moved forward in so many ways, but the little instances show us that we we still have so much work to do. It's tiring, but I'll let somebody else um, get Thank a chance. Mm -hmm. Alan, and then Juwan. Well, I think it's important that um, we recognize when we are, or our brothers or sisters, sisters are being violated. And I think it's, um, it's also important for us to understand it's not just, and, and I'm going to say this, and I hope, you know, you guys, you know, take this information how you want it, but it's hard to navigate the system when the whole system is racist. Yep. And, and um, you know, when you really think about that part of it, it's um, it makes it difficult, you know, because if we were going to boycott every business that is racist, I mean, there's the, the whole system is racist against us, and so what what we um, ought to um, work towards is not changing our opinion or changing our mindset around the oppression, but really attacking the structural members that hold those institutions of racism in place. And that is where the work is. That's the hard work, you know, because there's a whole lot of fight. And I spent as a technology educator, I was one of a few and for a long time, the only person of color in the room. And that is, uh, that's a hard place to stand, you know, when you're dealing with so much privilege, you know, telling um grown <laughs> okay but i just gotta say this so i worked this job at this very high-end private school in minneapolis a lot of the richest wealthiest families send their kids there and i've actually had um, conversations i would tell a parent no they can't do like no right and they would go tell the head of school and i would get called into a meeting and, um, you know, I'd have these old white men saying, no one's ever told me no before. And I've even had someone say, I've never had a nigger tell me no. <laughs> like, I'm not in the room, right? <laughs> I laugh when I say that, tell that story. But these are the white folks we deal with. I mean, the reality is um, some people just have not recognized the uh, the value of black life. I don't know whether another way to say it, but I think that's pretty much it. And it is, it is on us to make sure that, um, you know, we are safe and we're keeping our people safe. And, uh, we recognize when people are being violated, you know, and it's, um, 
I, I, man, yeah, yeah. <laughs> y'all don't even know. It's uh, it's hard not to just be the angry black man all the time. I don't know another way to say that. It's it's almost impossible not to be that. So let me give you an example. I took my kid to Legoland. This is pre-pandemic. We're at Legoland. We just go all the time. And uh, this young sister, probably late 30s, her kid comes running up to her crying with a nut on his head. And some kid was in the, the pirate ship, it's called, with a little jungle gym thing. It was in there just being filed, all these other kids. And I had seen them earlier, and I told my kid, don't go play in there. Let's go play over here, because this dude is just off the chain, right? And so this kid hits this other kid in the head. Um, and so the kid comes and tells his mom. So the mom, of course, approaches the other mom about what's going on. And at this time, we were kind of getting ready to leave. And I told my son, we're going to stay here until this woman is ready to go. I'm not going to leave with this angry white lady and her angry husband. And it's just this sister and her child. And I just stood there like the lady didn't know me. I didn't know her. It wasn't important if I knew who she was or not. What was important is that she needed to know that she was not by herself in that moment. Right. And she needed to know that, you know, you know, her safety and her her ability to stand her ground for her kid wasn't going to be interrupted because she, you know, would choose to fight a different battle because she would be by herself. And so when we left out of there, my kid goes, did you know who that was, dad? And I go, no, I didn't know who it was. He goes, so why did we stay there? I said, we stayed there because she needed to know that, you know, if this whole situation went, you know, went off the rails, and I hate using slang with my kid because he doesn't really understand <laughs> language like that. But I said, if it goes, if everything goes bad, she needs to know that there's somebody who's going to stand up for her and stand with her. And he goes, oh, I go, yeah, we have to be able to show people that, you know, they're not just going to be victimized and we're just going to be OK with them being hurt. That's not OK, you know. And then he was like, oh, so we turn this moment into a teachable moment. And when we were leaving, I told her, I said, I wasn't leaving you. And then she just said, thank you, put her head down and almost started crying. I was like, I wasn't leaving you. <laughs> I was not gonna let these white folks, you know, not be responsible for their kids' behavior. That's just not something as people we gotta do. And so what was problematic is when the white ladies started getting loud, the people from the Legoland staff came over. And now it's like, you know, the, this black woman, this angry black woman trying to protect her kid against this white lady and her husband and the staff of Legoland. And that's when I was really, that's when I just, I'm right here, sis. I ain't going nowhere. We go figure this out. And uh, I think as people of color, we really have to recognize how vulnerable our sisters are. And our brothers are out there by themselves at times. You know, we got to be able to, um, you know, as John Lewis says, make good trouble mm -hmm. and um, stand our ground for folks. Um, but we can't be leaving our folks out here to be abused. We have a responsibility as well to make sure that um, if they do have to enter into some sort, of, some sort of conflict or some verbal assaulting um, that they're not standing all by themselves. And I think that's important. Um, and it was an important lesson for my kid to learn in the moment. He learned a lot that day and it was good. It was good for him to see that. So, I don't know. Thank you. Thank you. Powerful, powerful and, and awesome demonstration of what um, we can do when we are in support of one another. Right, you know, Kay, you talked a lot about holding places accountable. Well, sometimes holding places accountable is coming in a community to do that, 
right? Because right. sometimes doing that by yourself, you know, we deal with imposter syndrome, we deal with fear, we deal with perceptions, all of these things. But when we do things in community and you have someone there with you to watch your back or, you know, watch your six, you know, as we say, you know, mm-hmm. that that helps, you know. Um, and so, you know, Joanna, I want to ask you, you know, you know, Terry, I mentioned that you visited, you know, the epicenter, you visited you know, a place, the place where all this was going on. Um, how did you feel visiting that? Um, I, felt, uh, very, I felt very um, unfortunate um, about that place. Um, it was very heartbreaking seeing um, all the looting and um, um, the damage on the building and all these other stuff. And it was very, uh, uh, and finally watching uh, all the names being right down on the uh, on the street, and but uh, very heartbreaking because uh, I witnessed uh, some uh, deaf people uh, as I was there, and how they're explaining themselves. They were going through the same situation as well. And and like I said, with uh, they're not getting the complete access with them, and they're uh, just threatened by uh, com- the police not communicating with them, not operating with um, with them uh, wellly. So, but um, overall, I think um, it was a um, wonderful. Uh, I think it was a, a lesson learned experience. For me, um, especially uh, coming from uh, being um, young and growing up learning about uh, experiencing this at a young age. And that's basically why I invited Juwan, um, being that he's interning with Nash Inspired, he had an opportunity to come to Minnesota and work with um, a project that we were doing with the Sounds of Blackness. So Jawan and I actually had just finished doing the uh, interpretation ASL video of Sick and Tired by uh, the Sounds of Blackness. And so, um, yeah, Greg, that's uh, basically what we also, we have to do in this struggle is make sure that we've got the ones behind us shielded so that they, these young people know we got their back as we're out here navigating, we're also leaving a trail for them to come through and we're equipping them with the EI and the mentorship that they need to know that we see them. Oh, that's great, that's great, absolutely. So, so with all that being said, um, how do we go and continue this work, right? As professionals, as individuals, advocates in our own right, as individuals who seek to dismantle and deconstruct systems that have been perpetual uh, constructs of pain for many people, how do we, in our in our respective areas, how, how do we continue to work, right? For those watching, right? And, and, and what encouragement can we share with them regarding being able to be resilient and persist through all that we're experiencing? So, so that's, that's the question we wanna, we wanna kinda share as we're kinda rounding out the hour. How do you continue the work? I can go uh, from the perspective of um, solidarity. We must continue to not ignore situations. We must continue to unify and stand up in solidarity when it happens to our sisters and brothers. We have to make time like we did today to, to give it um, give it some give it some light to shine some light on it and 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 air it we need to air it out we need to collaborate um, with other brilliant like minds uh, mm-hmm. to navigate change it's not okay so personally I will continue um, my quest to find no matter where I go I'm I'm just passing through the epic center. Um, 
it's, it's, it's a lot going on here. And like Martin Luther King said in the 60s that Chicago was the most segregated city he had ever visited. That's on record. Well, coming here with a master's in education and having to file appeals on uh, St. Paul Capitol uh, to, to be able to teach social studies, I'm getting my own taste of, of it. I'll be able to write a novel when I leave here, but I'm just mm -hmm. passing through. I'm, I'm, I'm actually uh, mapping an exit plan because it's unfortunate. This Minnesota nice is, 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 is more than a notion for me. But in the meantime, when it happens here, we must continue to unify in solidarity to air it, you understand, to lead the way. We, you muted, John. There you go. I was a liar. I didn't touch my phone, so Zoom can <laughs> stop cutting up. Zoom and the Epic Center can stop cutting up. What I was saying is, uh, while I'm here, I will continue to uh, unify and unite with like minds, brilliant leaders to, to be a change agent. Um, racism is not okay, blatant or covert, it's not okay. We must continue to give it light. We must continue to fight the good fight for change, okay? We must continue to push with iron spines until change of equality and justice is won for each and every human being, okay? So that is what I pledge to do, continue to use my breath, to use my intelligence, to document, to voice, okay? Uh, to voice justice for injustices wherever I, uh, whatever space I occupy. And so your problem is my problem, okay? So we must continue to lead the way um, and, and demand uh, equality and justice for all people, especially black people, African American people, whichever you, you prefer to be called. So that's what I'll continue to do use my education and my voice that's to right. stand up for change. Thank you. Right. I think, I think we just really, it's, it's a good idea to think about our spheres of influence that we have and who our circle is made up of. And at the same time, we have to um, demand of our local representatives, we, we have to demand a seat at the table, um, especially when dealing with issues that directly affect us. I mean, we can have these, these big picture, oh, we got to vote and get, you know, Democrat in office or whatever, but locally, like who's in charge, of, who's the sheriff, who the judges are, who's on a school board. I mean, all these commissioner level, we need to know who these folks are, right? And so I think as, as um, you know, breaking it down to, you know, the people we can see when we're in Target every day, if you go to Target every day, but the people we can see when we're out shopping, those are the people we need to hold accountable. I mean, all these senators and, and, and the president and all, that's all nice and well and good. We can't forget about all our local reps. Those people are so important to the daily life that we have. It's like, who's a person in charge of closing all these damn schools in my neighborhood? I want to speak, I want to see that person, right? Those are the folks that we, we can't forget about. I I totally agree with both of you guys. You know, it's not fair. It's not fair. And I believe that, you know, we all need to unify. You know, and then we do have to write, especially like our politicians and higher ups, you know, those who are in leadership roles. Plus, we have to be careful with, you know, our surroundings and those who we keep in our circles. You know, that's all. And I believe just keeping dialogues open like this and being able to have an opportunity um, with follow 
ups and follow throughs and um, continuing to create these spaces like um, Greg has facilitated us to do today. Absolutely, absolutely. And you know, if I, if I wanna to contribute to this for me, it's simply what, um, uh, what I stated in our in, in, in my intro, when Terry Ann read, read my intro about who I was, you know, one of my favorite quotes, you know, comes from the Reverend James Lawson, right, who we know was an architect of, of the movement, right, uh, and here in Nashville, Tennessee, as a matter of fact, where I'm currently living. And he was saying, you know, I heard him speak, you know, a couple of years ago at a, 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 a conference and he stated, we are citizens of a country that does not yet exist. It is our hmm. job to usher in to that, uh, usher in that country into existence. And I think that's our responsibility to recognize that we're in a space, we're in a place that is bigger than us, right? And that we're citizens of a place of equity, of a place of equality, of a place where, where justice reigns and justice is true, a place where all people are truly created equal and have the civil rights that, and the rights and liberties that this country has inscribed in its documents. We're citizens of that place, right? And our responsibility is to hold the system accountable to get to that point. Our responsibility is to do whatever we got to do, is to use your gifts, use your talents, use whatever your God-given abilities are to do that. Because when you use your gifts, it will be best for others and it'll be best for the next generation. You know, I think of my daughter, right, who is just but a little one, not even not even four months old, barely, you know, I'm creating a world for her so that when she grows up, she's not having to deal with the challenges that many of us have faced and are those that have preceded us face. And so for me, I'm seeking to create a world, a system that is beneficial for her. Why? Because we're citizens of that right? We're called to higher than we currently are. And so, listen, I want to just thank each and every one of our panelists for their contributions, for everything that was stated um, throughout our time on today. Uh, Terri Ann, I want to transition back to you for, for, for you to close us out uh, with any final thoughts that you may have or that you may want, to, want us to kind of go back and share, but I want to kind of transition to you now. Sure. Thank you, Greg. I want to, first of all, say thank you to all my panelists for coming today. And thank you for being able to share as professionals out here in the field. I also want to let you know responsibly that as I mentioned in the beginning of this panel discussion that this was not in any way a conversation to bash any particular organization or industry, but merely to hold people accountable like we said. So with that, I could not have been responsible to have a panel discussion like this and know that I was going to air it without reaching out to the Hilton. So when I didn't hear back from the corporate office three weeks ago, I began to follow the CEO, Mr. Chris Nasarthi. I hope I'm saying that right. And in following him, I found out that man really does live the life. He walks the walk. In three weeks, he has done outreach with COVID packages. He has done for underserved communities. He is a transparent man. So I said, well, in all fairness to him, I'm going to give him a courtesy email, letting him know we'll be having this conversation. And I kid you not, without, within four hours, there was someone from the corporate office reaching out to me. And each time that I've talked with someone from corporate office, I've had the opportunity to talk to a person of color. And in each time, they have reached out and followed through. The last time was not a person of color, but the original person point of contact which the woman on the phone was, and the one person today. In the person today, I found out that that staff member was let go. Unfortunately, was it her fault? I'm not sure. But they are also investigating the location. So, and they're working with me. So it's my hope that maybe we can have a second panel and bring that brother back in and talk about this from another perspective of conflict resolution and how we can not only just hold places accountable, but also work with them as they struggle or they navigate to find solutions. So I just wanna thank again, all of you, because I didn't know if we would have a happy ending or if we would have something positive on the other side. 
but I can honestly say that I also got the email just 10 minutes before this panel discussion following up from corporate with um, that contact information to move forward. So Greg, I'm not, I'm not gonna say it's a win-win, but we have made some strides just in the power of having a panel discussion. That's awesome. Some progress is better than none yes, progress. Absolutely. I was happy. I'm happy to hear that. Um, I was just going to mention critical race theory says racism is permanent. And we know from reading history books that to be so. But as educators and leaders, we must still unify and speak up against it. And I'm happy to hear that you got some attention to this matter from you said that's the is that the president? What's the name and what's its title? Chris Nasarki is actually the president and CEO of the Hilton brand. And yes, he had someone reach out to me within four hours of him receiving the email, which tells me that there was someone within the corporate structure that dropped the ball because they were not aware of this situation at all. And they immediately got on. it. Well, amen. I'm pleased to hear. I'm pleased to hear that you did some due diligence and you were able to see that he has not only said put together COVID packages, but he's doing some social justice work himself. Yes. I'm happy to hear that. That pleases my heart. Just like your story grieved my heart to hear you in this with a, on a positive note that, that, that lift my spirits up. So I don't have to not patronize them. You know, the you, most positive note I could actually end with would be to be able to have the opportunity to present on the platform that I came there for. And that was to talk about a branding opportunity. And I think what better way to do that is to let them know that we are all out here. Since you mentioned Kay, that you're also a Hilton's member, honor member. Yeah. <laughs> Little plug for Hilton. So in closing, um, I, you know, I, I try to be fair. I have no art in my heart, but we just got to really deal with the issues and, um, we need to hold people accountable. If you're getting up, going to work, and you got issues, deal with your issues, but yes. bring them to your job in closing. If you are a person that you know that you are not um, dealing from a perspective that is fair uh, and you don't see everyone as equal, then maybe it's time to get retrained or find a new, uh, a new job. Because the whole thing is at the end of the day, we do not need people who come with their baggage into places because when you bring your stuff to work, you not only are representing yourself, but you represent the company that you work for and you don't have the right to ruin someone else's day, career, or experience. Sure. Good point. Thank you. Right. So check the chat box, y'all. I agree. Before y'all go. And thank you again for this opportunity. Uh, let's make sure that we um, celebrate our brothers and sisters putting, uh, you know, all that knowledge together and giving us a opportunity to um, be enlightened. So thank you. How many more minutes do we have? We over. We're over. We're over. <laughs> okay. All right, then. Well, it was nice. Thank you, everybody. And I want to just put out to the universe that Terry, you and you get the opportunity and, and this panel gets the opportunity to spend a week at the same Hilton that wronged you to do your presentation. And um, we all be comps for our stay there. I want to just put that out to the universe for us to accept or reject that offer when they uh, uh, when they answer to your proposal to do so. Wonderful. So with passing the torch and giving this, I would like to just hear from our next generation, our, our, our millionaire, millennial, and then Mr. Greg, if you would close us out, I would greatly appreciate it. That's you, Juwan, millionaire, millennial. I'm speaking it on you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll be happy. <laughs> okay. I'm really thankful to be able to join you guys, uh, join this panel. And I look forward to hearing from your opinions as well. And I love you guys.
Thank you so much for that. Listen, I just want to say thank you to all the panelists for your your words, your encouragement. Um, I want to just, we appreciate your knowledge and your wisdom um, that was imparted in this space. Uh, and I just want to encourage each and every one of you to keep on going, right? We have much work to do, much yeah. work to do. And uh, yes, we just experienced, you know, an incident that happened at the Hilton, but truth be told, there's Hiltons all over the world in all of our communities and all of our churches and our corporations and our nonprofits, all of them have those experiences, whether it's in a more of an iota of an experience, a smaller scale or stuff that's even larger and granular. Um, but regardless of the fact, it's a lot of these experiences that are happening to many of our people. And I just wanna encourage you to keep on going, find your reprieve, find your space to be yourself, but then remember to get back into the game right? You are needed, you are valuable, and you are appreciated by our generations past and our generations to come. Sister Terri Ann, we thank you so much for allowing us to enter into this space with you, right, to be a part of your story and your journey. And so we thank you and affirm you. We thank you to our interpreter for being here with us and for um, doing an excellent and amazing job in that. Um, and so for those of you who have participated, hey, let us know what you think about this. Drop a comment in the chat. Um, feel free to connect to us. I know when Terri Ann drops this, she'll be putting our, our contact information or ways to get in contact with you. We would love to continue the conversation to get in contact with you, whether it's in another form just like this or individually, um, but feel free to reach out to us. Uh, thank you all for uh, coming in and uh, we hope to continue the conversation with you at another time. Thank, thank you and have a good one. Thank you all. Stay safe, everybody. Yep, take care, y'all. Yes. All right, guys. Take care. Thank all right. Bye-bye. Inspired. Live. Nash inspired. <laughs> <laughs> bye, bye Oh, that's awesome. Take care.